and welcome back to the show. Great to have you here today on this Total Wellness Tuesday episode where we are going to be dissecting the five science-backed reasons why you may not want to skip breakfast, why that skipping of breakfast could actually be detrimental to your body. So I think it's really important that although there is a lot of research be, uh, around intermittent fasting that we have to decide if it's right for us. And that we're always playing devil's advocate to see if there's another side to the research, if there's another side to our physiology where that this might be something that's good in the short term, but maybe not in the long term. And I hope by the end of today's show, you at least have a different perspective, a new way of looking at things that also might be helpful for your overall health, your body transformation, your anti-aging. So just to start the show, I do want to say that I do sometimes skip breakfast myself and that I do believe in a longer intermittent fast during certain periods of the week or month or quarter. And we're going to talk about all of that here today. So I just want you to know up front, I'm a big believer in intermittent fasting. I believe it's probably when you when combined with functional medicine detoxification, when those two things are combined, which they should be, I believe it's the closest thing right now we have towards the fountain of youth. I really do believe that uh, because your body's own production of stem cells and autophagy and all these great things happening. So I'm a big believer in that. What I see right now and why I feel that someone has to be the one to state this is that whatever is good can also be taken too far. And so all I try to do is bring you another perspective to look at this, meaning like I'm one of the biggest supporters of intermittent fasting, and I have been from way back. Again, like if you go back to my podcast, which started in 2016, you'll hear me talk about the fountain of youth. You'll hear me talk about autophagy. You'll hear me talk about that year, the Nobel Prize in oncology, which is cancer-based research, is fasting and autophagy. So again, I've been a big proponent for a long time. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years went by and people said, well, if 12 hours is good, how about 14? How about 16? Well, if that's good, why not 23 out of 24? And then you just eat all of your food within one hour. And now I've shown you research on many previous podcasts, and I have a whole category now just on intermittent fasting, which we will link up today. So all show notes today will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 1880, stephencabral.com forward slash 1880. 1880 and uh, previous podcast on intermittent fasting will be there as well because intermittent fasting is a broad subject and I can't give you everything all in one show. So today is not about the good or the bad or how long it should be or how long it shouldn't be. I've answered those questions before, all based on science as well, as well as Ayurvedic based wisdom. And all of those shows can be found. I'll just link them up at uh, 1880 today, stephencabral.com forward slash 1880. Okay. So we're going to go over five reasons right now, right now, why you may not want to skip breakfast, why at least you may want to think about it. Okay. So keep in mind, a lot of intermittent fast, fasting right now is 16-8, 16-8, 16-8. What does that mean? Well, it basically means that you have an eight-hour window to eat. For most people, it's 12 noon to 8 o'clock at night. Now, again, I'm not going to talk about that window. I've already talked about a better window than that on previous shows. That's not today's show. So we're just going to go over that. But basically what it means is that you're skipping breakfast, you're going to lunch, and then you're having lunch and you're having dinner. And some people might do a mid-afternoon snack to get three meals in a day. That's you know, depending on the diet they're following, that's how it works. So, and again, there are different variations. Some people do 20 hours and they just have two meals inside of that four hour window. And so again, intermittent fasting is simply a period of time longer than 12 hours. That's all there is to it. Okay. So here's the thing though, we have to understand, and I'm just going to go through a couple basics right here. Point one, number one is this, is the goal of intermittent fasting is to optimize blood sugar as well. That's one of the goals. There's autophagy, there's you know the cleanup, the cellular cleanup of the body, there's giving the digestion a chance to rest, all of those things. But a lot of people do it because they wake up with higher levels of blood sugar. The problem is this, and this is really important. Some people also tend towards hypoglycemia, especially more of the ectomorph or, or vata body type or athletes. So you have to be careful because overnight you're using up a lot of those glycogen based stores and your body is tapping into body fat overnight and it's using some glucose. Your body's never typically 100% of one, well, it's never 100% of one uh, and zero of the other, meaning burning body fat, 
or burning uh, blood sugar. So gl glucose being broken down from glycogen or simply glucose from your previous meal that was digested within the last few hours. So when we look at that, we want to. one of the goals is to optimize blood sugar. So if you wake up and your blood sugar is in the 60s, low 70s or 60s, or maybe even a little bit lower, why skip breakfast? Like, what, what are you doing to skip breakfast? Again, a lot of this is going to be for you to answer for you or to, to think about. I just want you to think about that. If your blood sugar is already optimized, what are you optimizing for then when you are skipping breakfast? I just want you to ask yourself that, okay? It's something to think about because I'm going to be talking about autophagy in just a moment. There's a better way to do autophagy than with a 16-8. For sure there is, okay? That extra four hours is not going to get you as deep. I've done a whole show on the different phases of autophagy, everything from the basically 12 to 24 hours to 36 hours to 48 hours to 72 hours. Check out that show as well. We'll link it up with all the intermittent fasting ones at 1880 today. Okay, so this is the big thing. If your blood sugar is already optimized, think about that. Why do you need to skip breakfast? All right. Again, it's something for you to think about. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm asking you to think about it. The next part is this, along with the same uh, level here. If your blood sugar is not optimized, yet you skip breakfast, and you get a greater cortisol spike from skipping breakfast because your body's a little bit stressed from not eating, and that cortisol then causes your body to break down more glycogen, stored glucose as glycogen, and put that in the bloodstream, is that helpful? And the answer is no. Now, if your cortisol doesn't spike beyond the normal cortisol awakening response, which is what happens between about 6 and 8 in the morning, your body naturally revs up cortisol, which is a good thing, because then melatonin begins to drop, which allows you to feel awake, not groggy anymore. It also helps with thyroid, etc. But if it spikes too much, we have a real issue. And one of the ways you can also test this is with a stress hormones mood and metabolism test. And you can find that over at Equilife, E-Q-U-I You can do it right at home. And if your insulin is high in the morning with that four, first morning uh, testing period right there, and let's say it's above a six, then you most likely know you got some type of stress-based response. Now, insulin has elevated, glucose elevated, right? Your blood sugar spiked because of stress even when you don't eat. So I, I did, I've done a, a bunch of podcasts where people have asked me how you can get a blood sugar spike in the morning just from getting the kids ready from stress or having a cup of coffee. And it's because caffeine induces a stress response. Kids getting them ready for school can induce a stress response. So again, keep that in mind. One of the things that helps to blunt cortisol, believe it or not, is breakfast and some carbohydrates. So it's just something to think about. All right, point number two, and again, all of this is all backed by science. So literally, I've given you all the research on previous shows, cortisol awakening response, um, how cortisol breaks down liver glycogen, which then goes in your bloodstream, which then increases uh, pancreas production of insulin. Okay, so again, like all of this backed by science. Number two, satiety during the day can be helpful for not overeating. Meaning this, if you eat breakfast, you're most likely going to be a little less hungry for lunch. So you eat a normal lunch. And if you eat a normal lunch, you're most likely going to be a little less hungry for dinner. But I've noticed myself, when I do a longer fast, if I do a 24-hour fast, which we'll get to in just a few minutes, I'm typically pretty famished. You know, I wouldn't say starving, it's a bad use of the word, but in, in our Western-based philosophy, I'm starving by dinner time. So what do I do? Well, I sometimes eat my entire day's worth of calories in that one meal for dinner. Now, what happens with that? Well, now I need to break down 2,000 plus calories in one meal, where for me, a meal is never more than 1,000 calories. Again, for you, a meal might never be more than 500 calories. So now I'm eating a day's worth in one meal because I'm so hungry. So what does that cause? It causes overeating one meal. Why is that a big deal if you're just eating the same amount of calories? Well, it's because of the energy loss. When you put that much food in your stomach, you have more energy to break down that food. There is more potential for fermentation in the stomach and in the gut because you have so much food there, it's going to take longer to break down. You need more stomach acid. You need more enzymes. You're going to need more bile production as well all at once. And what else is going to happen? Well, you're more likely to spike blood sugar with a large meal regardless of its glycemic index. Let me repeat that again. Even if you're not eating 
high carbohydrate or processed foods at that meal. There's something called glycemic load. So let's say you have a massive steak. Okay, let's say you have a big steak. You're on a you know carnivore-based diet. You eat that steak, and there's 70 grams of protein in it, and there's you know a bunch of fat, whatever it might be. Okay, you eat that meal. You're definitely spiking blood sugar. And, you can, and again, you can test this. You just use a glucometer. I just talked about it on uh, one of my last Friday reviews. A great new gluco glucometer that I've been using. And uh, what happens with that? Well, you get a blood sugar spike because of the large protein meal. So just again, don't overlook that as well. That's why a lot of people on keto-based diets are not actually on a keto diet. Uh, they believe they are, but they've been given some bad information about what a keto diet actually looks like. So if you're eating a lot of protein on a keto diet, even if it's at just one meal, you're certainly uh, spiking blood sugar. No doubt about that. And again, you can test. That's why all of these things are science-backed. So be careful with uh, overeating later in the day, which is absolutely much worse for you. It's better to front load your day with food rather than back load your day with food. It affects deep sleep. And again, all of these things are testable. Uh, it affects your digestion. It affects your energy production. So when you look into Ayurvedic based wisdom, their intermittent fasting would be, or the eating cycles would actually be more in reverse. And I talk about this again on previous shows. I keep saying that because I really want you to understand the full context. There's no way I can fit all of this information into a 20 minute show. So I'm giving you five reasons today. But if you were to skip any one meal, it would definitely be dinner. You'd be much healthier skipping that one rather than breakfast. I go into that in previous shows. Okay, number three is this. The third reason out of five is you're going to have better cognitive function. Stay with me here for a second because I know most people won't believe this. You'll have better cognitive function when you eat breakfast. There are many studies that show this. However, there's a lot of anecdotal re uh, research that shows people, uh, they feel that people who don't eat breakfast actually have better cognitive function. Let me explain why. People that skip breakfast and feel better and lighter have digestive issues. But that's the bottom line. So if you eat breakfast and you feel tired or weighed down, it is a digestive system issue. The food is not the problem. If you get tired after you eat, let me repeat this, you have a digestive system imbalance. And that can be fixed. But it's also a good symptom for you to have saying, huh, I should be able to have food and not feel like I'm going to fall asleep afterwards, right? You shouldn't have to fast. Remember, if you fast, the reason why you might feel better is because you're doing what? You're spiking norepinephrine. You're spiking stress hormones. You're going to be more alert. But at what? Well, at the expense potentially down the road of continuing to stay in that sympathetic nervous system cycle. And also the muscle loss that comes along with it. I just did, again, a show just about a month ago with high-level research studies. I know a lot of people don't like, they didn't like the studies, but the research studies showed that 16-8 fasting often results in muscle loss for many people, except if you do one particular thing, which, again, we talked about. All right, so that's an important one. Remember, the brain, the brain runs off of ideally glucose. And again, when I say this, I don't mean eat processed food. I don't mean that at all. And I, and I don't mean spike blood sugar. I mean normal levels of homeostasis. Blood sugar between around, what, 75 and 90 would be ideal for me. That, that's that's for ideal for anybody. So when we look at that, good. All the systems of the body have enough glucose, and the body's going to tap into body fat. Don't rem I mean, let's not get it twisted at all. I know like a lot of people say you need to be low blood sugar in order to bar burn body fat. You don't. You don't at all. What you need to do is be in an aerobic state, okay? So not sympathetic nervous system dominant, not anaerobic based, and you're going to tap into body fat throughout the day. So that, that's the state that you need to be in, more parasympathetic. And again, tr exercise training is completely different. There's nothing wrong with being in an anaerobic state while training, but we just have to understand you're not going to be burning ketones, breaking down ketones, and, uh, and fat as your primary fuel when you're doing sprints that last 30 seconds. That's just not going to be the case, right? It's just, it's simply not how our physiology works. Okay. So again, the brain likes glucose. It could work off ketones, but the question you have to ask yourself is why be in a ketogenic state? Like unless you're under medical supervision, you're doing something specifically, why be in that state? Now, we use in our practice as well. We get people teetering in and out of it for about 21 days or so, but then we transition them right out for normal living and also health as well because a ketogenic state for many people is a higher stress-based state. All right, number four is this. 
Breakfast, believe it or not, can lead to and often does a higher metabolism as long as that breakfast contains some protein. So we know that protein is a high thermogenic food. We also know that it boosts metabolism. We know that being satiated and keeping blood sugar levels balanced, which protein helps to do, allows you to tap into more body fat. Conversely, if you drop into low blood sugar or you're in a sympathetic nervous system state, that cortisol awakening response gets exacerbated by a drop in blood sugar or stress, you're going to do what? Well, your body's going to end up breaking down more glycogen to turn into glucose for the bloodstream. And then what's going to happen if you don't use it, because if you're not really doing exercise, you don't need to burn up that sugar, well, it's going to end up what? Turning more to body fat or staying as free circulating glucose in your bloodstream, leading to potentially type 2 diabetes or at least an inability to tap into as much body fat. So really, really important. A good breakfast can help blunt that uh, sympathetic nervous system fight or flight based state. Helps with the HPA axis for those adrenals. Number, And that's why if you have adrenal based issues, you have to be really careful skipping breakfast, really. If you have adrenal based issues, most people are going to need to eat about an hour maximum within, wake, within waking. All right, number five, the last one is this. Eating breakfast can improve mood and neurotransmitters. So think about it this way. If your body, and it's already built in, right? If your body is in a stressed-based state, remember, taking away food, being hungry, and not eating is stressful for your body. Take your mind out of the equation. It's stressful for your body. Your body's saying, where's the fuel? You're asking us to go to work. You're asking us to give presentations. You're asking us to get the kids ready. You're asking us to sit in traffic and be stressed, like whatever it is. And it's saying, well, okay, I'll do that, but where's the fuel? Right? I just went 12 hours without eating. You stopped eating at, let's say, 7 o'clock the night before. It's 8 in the morning now. It's been 13 hours. Where's my food? Right? That's what it's saying. And so what does it do? Well, it gets you into more of a what? Stress-based state so that you can get tunnel vision focus on what? Finding your food if it was many thousands of years ago. Now, you know, your food's a, it's an, it's at arm's length, right? It's literally an arm's length away from most time uh, where your food is. So your body is saying, well, let's do this. Let's increase norepinephrine, uh, one of our first stress hormones. Okay, it's a, stre it's a neurotransmitter. And let's increase dopamine. And you might say, okay, well, those are good things because what? You feel more alert. You do. But at the expense then of what? Remember, everything in your body is positive and negative, positive and negative. It's like a seesaw. It balances out. All right, so if you're spiking norepinephrine, you're spiking dopamine. Let's just talk about those for a minute for, for neuros. What happens? Well, your body then is going to say, well, let's try to calm these excitatory ones down somehow with what? Well, yeah, it'd be nice with meditation. That would be great. But what does it do? It's going to start to try to produce more serotonin, more GABA. These are inhibitory neurotransmitters to just find balance. Those ones eventually get burnt out as well, just like cortisol. Excess cortisol production over time, oftentimes you end up becoming less cortisol um, efficient at producing that, especially earlier in the day. You end up with what's called a um, dysfunctional diurnal rhythm where you start to produce more cortisol later in the day and less at the beginning of the day. And this happens all the time. We see this not just in chronic fatigue uh, based wellness clients, but many, many people out there that are just suboptimal in terms of their morning energy. And again, if you don't have morning energy, there is some type of thyroid, adrenal, hormone-based issue, it can be figured out on that stress hormones, mood, and metabolism. And if fasting makes you feel better, then you also want to look at a digestive aspect of that. Because again, you're, uh, you're getting the energy, but it's artificial. So if you get more energy in the morning by not eating, think about it, where's that energy coming from? You have to ask yourself that question. Where's your energy coming from? Maybe your caffeine in your coffee or your tea, or if you don't have any of those things, well, where's it coming from? Well, it's the own, it's your own adrenaline. It's your own norepinephrine that you're overproducing in cortisol potentially that is causing you to get that energy artificially. So we just want to be careful with this. And that's why I simply wanted to play devil's advocate today uh, with essentially skipping a meal when you're asking your body to do a lot of the work first thing in the morning. Now, I've talked about fasted cardio before. I've talked about functional medicine detoxing before. I've said how combining intermittent fasting and functional medicine detox is the closest thing we have to the fountain of youth. And, and again, I, I absolutely mean that. So what am I really saying to you? I'm saying this, is that 
for many people, and I would honestly say the majority of the people in my practice, they, they should not be doing 16-8, and especially a lot of the women that I work with because it ends up affecting their thyroid and metabolism and, and estrogen dominance as well. So for most people, they're good with 12 to 14 hours. Stop eating as early as you can at night, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, somewhere around there, and then go 12 to 14 hours. And it's not difficult to do because they're relaxed hours. Before bed is typically more relaxed, which means good, less sympathetic nervous system dominance, less relaxed reliance on glucose, more tapping into body fat. Okay, then you're in bed hopefully for eight hours, at least seven. So now we're at what? 11 hours right there. 12 hours maybe, right? Depends on what time you you stop your fast. Let's just say it's six o'clock at night, which is doable for a lot of people. Okay, we've got six hours to midnight. Great. And then let's say you sleep until six in the morning. Okay. Now we've got 12 hours. So most people now, they can just kind of get ready for the day. They can not be super stressed and then they'll eat. They'll have a smoothie or they'll have whatever an hour or so later. And you can, and you can do that, right? And you can kind of time release that smoothie with the protein in it for normal blood sugar balance. And so it seems to work best for most people that way. And remember, there's not dramatic difference between 12 and 16 hours for autophagy in the body. Now, this is where it gets more interesting. But you can strategically use intermittent fasting to your advantage by doing a once a week twice for some people, uh, 24-hour fast. And this is now where you'll get much more of the autophagy-based benefits that you're looking for. So instead of doing a little bit too much every day, right? You might want to do a once a week, uh, 24 hour fast, which is stop eating normal dinners Sunday night at six o'clock and then go the whole day on Monday until six o'clock that night or five o'clock that night when you have your dinner with your family or partner, et cetera. So now you just went 24 hours. Now you got a big day of really tapping into autophagy, body fat burning, all that great stuff. Mondays are typically busy days for people. I do this myself three out of four Mondays every single month. Uh, It comes after maybe a flex meal, cheat meal over the weekend. So it really enables you to reset things on a Monday. Now you do that one day a week and yes, it might be more stress in the body, no doubt about it for that one day, but it's not seven days a week or five days a week. And so you can see that your body can deal with a stressor like that better one day than constantly doing that every single day. So it's, it's something to think about. Again, I go much more in depth on all these different topics, uh, but you, you'll you definitely want to check after this show about the studies, about the, the muscle loss. You'll also want to check out on one of my other intermittent fasting shows, which is really important, why doing a 24-hour fast uh, to potentially 36 hours, which I'll be talking about in the coming uh, podcasts, as well as a monthly and, and longer quarterly facts, fasts are much more beneficial for you than even even the daily. And that's what you're not being told right now is you're being told that you just get so much more benefit by skipping this and skipping that. And we have to be careful. Some people can absolutely get away with it and they can do well. Other people, you run that lab, like I was telling you about, and all of a sudden you start to see cortisol get depleted in the morning, thyroid levels start to drop. And so uh, that lab, the stress hormones, mood and metabolism lab, you can run it with your local naturopathic doctor, functional medicine doctor, or integrative health practitioner, or you can run it uh, right at home uh, by going to equa.life, that's E-Q-I dot L-I-F-E, and you can have that lab shipped right to you and actually get a consultation along with it. But again, the choice is always yours. I just want you to know that all of this is backed up by science and you can actually prove it to yourself. Like maybe you're doing great. And if you are, then fantastic. I'd love to hear that. And now you validate it with that lab testing. So uh, once again, thank you so much for allowing me to play devil's advocate and share the other side of the equation because you know that I do love intermittent fasting. Uh, But I always want to give you more to think about as you continue to increase your health-based knowledge. So feel free to share the show with anyone you believe it could serve. Take care, everyone, and I'll talk with you tomorrow. 